Sorry for the inconveniency. We are losing the connectivity frequency. Dr. Angapan, you can go ahead with your presentation again. Sorry, much Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Start, sir. Okay. Slide, please. Okay. So I want to go fast actually. Uh, next slide. Next. So next, next, next. So it's a post examination process. Uh, so establishing diagnosis based on laboratory results. It's actually diagnosis is your part. So uh, uh, lab test results, uh, no, you can uh, easily uh, what to do. Uh, interpret uh, or order the lab test based on these uh, four different types of hypotheses. Sorry, four diff different like four different uh, points actually. Hypothesis detection, pattern recognition, medical algorithm, and rifle versus shotgun approach. Uh, next, so hypothesis detection. Uh, if you diagnose, if you have a doubt whether the patient is suffering from uh, febrile illness or uh, what uh, other uh, neurological related illness? You can order for a CSF test in which you'll have a white blood cell count, total protein, glucose, and bacteria. All the test comes normal or negative, then uh, your final diagnosis can be made as the patient is suffering from uh, febrile illness, uh, not other serious cause. Next. So uh, the pattern recognition is very important that uh, you know, you know basically uh, the, what pattern your patient has is one result. For example, uh, when you go for uh, diagnosing prehepatic, hepatic, and obstructive jaundice, so your uh, direct bilirubin and uh, uh, this total bilirubin will in turn increases during this uh, um, obstructive jaundice. And AST, ALT, ALP will also very high. And the PT test, because uh, the prothrombin uh, time is getting increased, uh, after giving vitamin K, I already said, your PT, uh, or uh, PT, uh, PT time is getting reversed means uh, the patient is most probably suffering from uh, what jaundice, uh, obstructive jaundice, and because he has a very high amount of bilirubin direct and bilirubin total, AST, ALT, ALP also, and uh, vitamin K, a, a, after giving vitamin K, the prothrombin time is getting normalized. Okay. So it's a algorithm, medical algorithm is very much useful in which, no, uh, for analyzing the thyroid disease. First, you have to do a TSH. Uh, so uh, unnecessarily, you are not supposed to do T3 or T4. And nowadays, no, I wanted to tell you one thing. People are not doing in total T3 and T4 because uh, the total hormone uh, will in turn bind thyroid binding realbumin or thyroid binding globulin. These are the two proteins which in turn bind with thyroid. So this uh, basically the total T4 and T3 basically depends upon the amount of uh, this binding protein. This Binding protein will have an impact on a lot of other factors, such as if suppose patient is pregnant, a patient is on estrogen, patient is on uh, contraceptive pills, or uh, patient is taking glucocorticoid or whatever it may be. What happened now, these, uh, we have a variation, uh, the low level of uh, this uh, binding globulin will have interference with your total thyroid. That is why nowadays people will go for a free T4. If suppose free, free TSH is getting elevated, you have to go for a free T4. 3T4 is uh, normal. Uh, since TSH is somewhat high, we can confirm the patient is suffering from subclinical hypothyroid. If suppose free, free T4 is very low, patient is having hypothyroid, you want to do it for uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, then you have to do for uh, two different tests, uh, two important tests, the thyroglobulin antibody test and uh, microsomal antibody, the thyroperoxidase antibody or otherwise microsomal thyroid antibody test. Uh, next. And for uh, we can use this medical algorithm for uh, analyzing grave disease also. In grave disease, uh, your TSH uh, is very low, then your uh, free T4 is also very high. Uh, TSH is uh, very low, T4 is very high, free T4 is very high. Then you have to do for uh, three different tests, whereas in hypothyroid, uh, uh, two different tests only. Now we have to add one more test. 
that is called the what uh, um, uh, that recept uh, TSH receptor antibody, uh, especially for diagnosing and the Graves disease. Next. And this medical algorithm is also very useful uh, for uh, what uh, to do this uh, RF positivity. Patient comes with RF positivity. So he's having uh, signs and uh, symptoms of persistent arthritis. Then uh, after you, you, are, you are supposed to order uh, anti-CCP, you know, anti-cyclic citrinated peptide. And if suppose anti-CCP is positive, RA is very likely. If suppose uh, uh, anti-CCP is negative, uh, uh, RA is likely, uh, we cannot rule out uh, this RA. And if suppose the RF positivity uh, with, uh, without any symptoms, then we have to do for a tighter test, RF uh, tighter test. If suppose tighter test is very high, uh, then you have to go for a, once again anti-CCP test. Anti-CCP test is positive, then you can suspect the patient may suffering from RA. If anti-CCP test is negative, then it's a very big question mark. Uh, then you have to screen for HCV. Uh, if HCV is positive, then you have to ask the patient to consult a pathologist or you have to take care of the liver. Uh, if it is negative, uh, that uh, tighter value is low, uh, tighter value is very high uh, and uh, anti-CCP is negative, mm, then uh, even HCV test is also negative, then you have to consider for other autoimmune diseases like surgeon syndrome, mixed connective tissue disorder, HCV infection, uh, biliary cirrhosis, even HIV infection also, malignancy, and uh, this healthy 70-year-old adults will have a 10 to 25 percent of uh, increase in tighter value of a RF. Uh, next. And uh, that's a referral to the shotgun is very important actually. So the patient with spiraxia, cephalalgia, retroorbital pain, osteodynia, and uh, other things, like arthralgia, fatigue, and prostration, uh, you'll come to a diagnosis whether the patient is having dengue or fever, dengue or rather uh, fever. And then uh, you have to, we suppose you think it's a dengue, you have to order the following test, uh, which you are shooting uh, the rifle with the target only. The WBC count, uh, platelet count, and hematocrit and the transaminases. And the C reactive protein is actually a marker uh, for bacterial disease. So, when there is a super infection of bacteria only, the CRP level is getting increased. Otherwise, CRP level is less than 40 only for all viral diseases. Basically, the physician, even pediatrician, will use CRP to distinguish the patient is really suffering from bacterial disease or viral disease. If your CRP is very high and your leukocyte count is also very high, your neutrophils are also very high, then you will come to a conclusion that the patient is suffering from bacterial disease and they will directly prescribe the medicine which is in turn will act on bacteria. Whereas your CRP is very low and the thing is that it is a clue that the patient may suffer from viral disease but in course of time during viral uh, progression what happened super infection of bacteria will happen in that case your crp is getting increased uh, that is what happening in uh, sars covid 19 also and ns1 uh, is a very specific antigen which is synthesized by means of a dengue virus like uh, what spike protein in covid uh, which is present in all dengue positive cases uh, so we have a dengue card in which ns1 and igg igm is there so you have a ns1 positive uh, even igg igm is negative you can order for a elisa, ELISA uh, dengue igg and igm so igm is the first antibody which is produced in a very shorter period of time after the infection maybe four to seven days uh, so after that only igg will develop igg development uh, will have 14 to so 15 days of time. So during primary infection, IgGM, IgM is the first antibody and IgG is the second antibody. Uh, during the secondary infection, it's ULTA, whereas IgG is formed immediately and IgM is taking place next to IgG only. So that we can differentiate the patient is suffering from a primary infection or secondary infection. Whenever there is an infection, once you infect it, the IgG will develop and it will persist in our system, whereas the IgM will develop only during the acute phases. So this antibody, uh, you can see during acute disease condition. So IgM, dengue IgM is a very important test. We have a dengue LSI IgM also and NS1 also. So if NS1 IgM IgG is positive, uh, definitely the patient is suffering from the dengue fever. If you want to confirm it, you can do it RT-PCR, uh, what currently we are doing it for 
uh, SARS CoV 2. And uh, RT PCR is somewhat a costly test. So we can confirm the diagnosis by means of IgG, IgM, NS1 antigen, and even for a C reactive protein and with AST and ALT because transaminases will get increased now. Basically, it's above 40 to 50, uh, sorry, above 80 uh, units per liter, as a normal value being 40 to 50. Now, because of liver injury automatically during uh, viral infection, these transaminases will getting increased. Except the thing is that hematocrit is high, so hemoglobin is also high, is because of hemoconcentration, not because of uh, the patient's own physiology. Uh, it's because of uh, dehydration and everything, your hematocrit, you can see the hematocrit and hemoglobin value is very high in all dengue cases, whereas uh, the thrombocytes, that is platelet, it's a very a good marker for uh, diagnosing dengue in which thrombocytopenia is happened. Uh, this is the reason for uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Next. Uh, uh, this is uh, what shotgun method. Instead of uh, doing uh, WBC hematocrit platelet, APTT, dengue, IgG, IgM, you can uh, some unnecessarily uh, doing urine analysis, electrolytes, ABG, total protein, uh, bilirubin, whatever it may be, it won't work. Next. And uh, next, uh, I want to talk something about vitamin D because uh, most of our project in the institute, you know, we are adding vitamin D as a normal parameter. But as a result, actually, what happened now? All the vitamin values, are, vitamin D values are very less. So I want to talk a little bit about vitamin D. How much time is that? 30 minutes. Okay. So uh, I myself published a paper on vitamin D during my research period, uh, in which actually, so I want to start with the history. So it's a battle of the Pelusium, uh, the major battle between Persia and Egypt, in which you, know, you can see you know, a soldier sitting on the horseback and he is throwing a cat uh, uh, towards his enemy, uh, not shooting the arrow. Uh, he's a Persian soldier, especially throwing uh, cats. Uh, we'll see uh, the thing uh, next. So uh, the thing is that you know, the Cambyas is the king of Persia, uh, Persian king, uh, won the war actually. Uh, people, historian used to say it's a decisive Persian victory because uh, the Egypt, you know, on the other side, they did not uh, shoot their arrow uh, because they are fear of uh, killing the cats because uh, the cats, you know, uh, it's equal to God in Egypt. So uh, the Pelusium was stormed easily and the Persian uh, or the uh, Persian uh, win the war. Next. Uh, so, the post war, uh, it was analyzed by Herodotus, uh, the Greek historian. I inspected the skulls of uh, uh, killed uh, Persian soldiers. Actually, the Persian skull were easily breakable with uh, pebbles, uh, even with very small stone. Whereas the Egyptians uh, had uh, no skull, no, it's very hard. They are unable to broke it by means of a big stone. And uh, they have a doubt how these uh, Persians. Uh, will uh, persons having a very weaker bone um, win the war? Uh, that is a question uh, first. Uh, the vitamin uh, D uh, will come into picture. So uh, after that, you know, the, during the 17th century, the Francis Gilson is a professor of physics actually, who, who will write a book on uh, treatise of the records being a disease of common children, in which he explains. Uh, what is the cause for deficiency of uh, vitamin uh, and D? Next. So uh, he only analyzed that, you know, because uh, it contains fellows uh, who are very rich in uh, vitamin D diet, uh, like uh, milk, egg, and fish, and everything. Uh, still, they are having deficiency of vitamin D is because of very damp climate in uh, England. And uh, he came to a conclusion that uh, exposure of sunlight is very important for uh, vitamin D. Uh, so, the recommended daily allowance of vitamin D is uh, 400 IU per day for children and 600 uh, for uh, people who are having 1 to 70 years of age and 800 IU for people who are having more than 70 years of age. Next. So, uh, so it's a vitamin D metabolism in which ergosterol is a commercial vitamin. Ergosterol is a commercial vitamin which can be converted into ergocalciferol. Um, by means of a sunlight, whereas uh, uh, in our system, 78 of cholesterol, uh, it's a precursor for vitamin D biosynthesis by means of UV, UV, UV light, 
this 78 of cholesterol is converted into cholic calciferol is nothing but a vitamin D3. So there is a difference between vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Actually, D3 uh, is a physiological form and commercial form of D3 is also available. Whereas no, foods, foods are basically fortified with uh, vitamin D2 only. And uh, basically in the US, a lot of foods are in turn fortified by means of vitamin D2. That is why the analyzer is capable of analyzing both vitamin D2 and D3. So next is uh, this uh, vitamin D3 is uh, uh, converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 by means of enzyme, which is called 25 hydroxylase, which is present in liver. So the liver plays a key role uh, in vitamin and D biosynthesis. And once the 25 hydroxylase is uh, synthesized, this can be converted into 1,25 dihydroxycholic calciferol, which is so we called as a hormone, which is most important for most of our activities. So it's a 25 hydroxylase in liver and one alpha hydroxylase uh, is present in, kit in kidney. So both liver and kidney are important for synthesis of vitamin D3 in active form. So basically, you no know, uh, vitamin D is more related to cardiac disease. If suppose your value is very low, we have to we have supposed to treat the vitamin D deficiency instead of leaving the people as such. So these include uh, insulin hypertension, thrombosis, and arterial classification, endothelial inflammation, cytokine. Cytokine is the most important thing. Vitamin D in turn reduces cytokine. One of the important cytokine is IL-6. So this IL-6 is getting increased during inflammation. Even COVID-19 disease also, this IL-6 is a very big thing. PTS toxicity is also there uh, because of uh, low vitamin D and cardiac remodeling. Uh, it's a pathological uh, thing happening during vitamin D. So how renin angiotensin system uh, will in turn have an impact with the vitamin D? Because it's a renin, uh, no, it's a very important compound which is responsible for vasoconstriction. If I have a high amount of renin, then I'll have a more amount of, uh, uh, of uh, what, uh, uh, vasoconstriction. So uh, renin will in turn increase the production of angiotensin, which will in turn increase uh, your systolic blood pressure to greater than 140 and diastolic blood pressure to greater than 90 milli millimeters of mercury. So what happened now in the presence of vitamin D, this renin uh, gene synthesis is getting reduced. Uh, so a vitamin 1,25 dioxide vitamin D will have a positive action by suppressing on the CAMP signaling pathway, thereby it suppresses uh, the renin production. So angiotensin production is also getting increased, uh, sorry, decreased. So angiotensin, once angiotensin is getting decreased, your hypertension will goes down. This is the mechanism how the vitamin D acts on your um, blood vessels and how it acts on reducing your blood pressure. So if suppose your vitamin D is very low, your PTH will in turn getting uh, increased because this vitamin D is useful for uh, what to say, uh, uh, used for absorption of calcium in the intestine. So if you have a vitamin, low vitamin D, uh, so your calcium deficit will happen in your uh, systemic circulation. So in order to in order to correct this, your PTH will in turn in increases. This PTH will in turn, uh, what happened now, uh, will produce an excess amount. Uh, so automatically the vascular uh, excess amount of calcium is produced as a result of excessive PTH. Uh, this will in turn leads to calcification, especially in the heart. Uh, so this calcification um, automatically leads to left ventricular hypertrophy also and heart failure also. That is why low vitamin D3 uh, will have an impact on uh, congestive heart failure and sometimes left ventricular hypertrophy also because of calcification. Calcification is because of low vitamin D. Low vitamin D is because of uh, absorption of vitamin D, uh, is because of less absorption of calcium and uh, increase amount of uh, parathyroid hormone. So vitamin D, parathyroid hormone and calcium are, are interrelated. So uh, other than that, uh, vitamin D will have a pre preventive action on atherosclerosis for preventing cerebrovascular accident also inflammatory arthritis, type 1 diabetes, mellitus, tuberculosis, and arthritis media, and a lot of other things. Vitamin D will act from uh, uh, act you from head to toe. And how we can relate renal failure and vitamin D? If suppose there is a low vitamin D, calcium will automatically goes down. So once calcium will automatically close down, osteoblast activity is getting increased. Once osteoblast activity is getting increased, your alkaline phosphatase level will get increased. And uh, because of low calcium, uh, PTH level is going high. And this PTH will in turn increases your serum calcium level.
this serum calcium level in turn binds into your arteries and even your uh, very small micro uh, arteries or whatever it may be and heart also in the left ventricle also so leads to left ventricular mm, hypertrophy so uh, the best way you have to measure vitamin d is 25 hydroxy form not 1 comma 25 because 1 comma 25 have a lesser half life whereas 25 hydroxy vitamin d3 has uh, two to three weeks of uh, um, life so uh, all laboratory will in turn prefer measuring 25 hydroxy vitamin d3 instead of doing calcitriol estimation and uh, this is a normal level of vitamin d3 so you can see uh, most of the patient it is uh, in a severe deficiency level only so uh, it's a very good photograph in which both uh, trump and uh, obama is there obama is having uh, naturally having vitamin d3 i because of his skin because he is having more melanin content uh, sorry obama is having uh, very less vitamin d3 when compared to trump because uh, this darker skin will have a more melanin and this melanin will in turn inhibit uh, uh, the uv light thereby the vitamin d production will also getting decreased in a darker person that is why i said uh, this obama is having little bit low vitamin d when compared to white people and uh, these are the graph actually whites is having very low amount of uh, population is having low vitamin d3 whereas blacks you know 10.2 percent hispanics also uh, vitamin d is sufficient uh, in a low and others also vitamin d is sufficient the thing is that um, blacks we need more amount of vitamin d3 because of high melanin content of the skin so yeah, in our india one study was conducted 70 to 90 percent of health population in india is deficit in vitamin d especially you now 61 to 70 years 70 years and um, this uh, vitamin d level is very low during the year of 51 to 60 years because they don't have any supplement whereas uh, 61 to 70 years people will have supplement uh, and less than 30 years because of less uh, sun exposure uh, and using sunscreen especially ladies will in turn decreases melanin level uh, thereby leads to vitamin d deficiency so the prescription is not a supplement so if suppose it's very deficient we have to go for a supplement otherwise we have to uh, prescribe the sunlight only so these are the this is the most important slide i am uh, rushing through most of the slide because uh, nowadays now we, we we are under the strain of uh, this covid 19 disease uh, in which uh, uh, a lot of biomarkers are uh, uh, in a role uh, as a biochemist uh, as i want to to talk a little bit about uh, this thing now biomarkers with respect to covid 19 disease so the complete blood count uh, we can do albumin we can do this lactate dehydrogenase alanine transaminase aspartate and uh, liver function uh, things like total bilirubin and kidney function uh, also creatinine and sometimes cardiac troponin also when uh, during the unfavorable condition in which your uh, even troponin i is positive so all the things you know basically uh, pro thrombin time pro calcitonin c reactive protein ferritin and most important the uh, last but not the least that is il6 is also getting elevated during uh, this uh, covid infection so white blood cell count uh, basically is because uh, this uh, bacterial super infection what i already said uh, so after uh, viral infection for quite long time so invasion of bacteria will also happen which will increase the neutrophil so uh, neutrophilia will, uh, will happen and uh, during the early stage what happened lymphocyte will going to be decreased uh, lymphopenia will happen and slowly slowly what happened our neutrophilia and white blood cell so white blood count is getting increased uh, and uh, this platelet count uh, is getting decreased because of consumption of uh, this coagulation protein and everything and uh, a decreased amount of albumin you can see because of mainly because of dehydration and because of this uh, cytokine storm uh, and the lactate dehydrogenase uh, especially we have uh, having different isoenzymes of uh, lactate dehydrogenase one two three four five among this ldh3 uh, is getting elevated because it's a marker of uh, pulmonary cells actually this lactate dehydrogenase uh, 3 is uh, basically present in pulmonary cells pneumocytic cells during the pulmonary injury what happened during end stage this LDL level is getting increased and it's a clear indication of uh, organ damage with respect to lungs actually you have a more amount of LDH then your uh, lung is getting extremely affected and you need ventilation in short course of time uh, for recovery and this alanine aspartate transaminase both are uh, transaminases 
uh, which will have an impact on uh, liver injury. So uh, during end organ failure, and these two enzymes, uh, aspartate transaminase and renin transaminase, otherwise we can call SGOT and NGCBT is getting increased. And uh, among this, uh, I want to tell you the C-reactive protein is not uh, too much high during the initial stage, but uh, after the sepsis happens, this uh, CRP is getting increased. So during unfavorable uh, condition, what happened? And the CRP is very high. And ferritin is also acid phase reactant in which is getting increased. And cytokine, especially IL-6, is getting increased. And other cytokines like IL-1, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and uh, INF, uh, IFN gamma, uh, interferon gamma is also getting increased. So what is the role of cytokine now? So a severe COVID patient, uh, for, uh, they have been infected for more than uh, 20 or 25 days or whatever it may be now. The killer is really not a virus, whereas the killer is an immune response. So the cells actually, mass cells, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, and tissue macrophages will in turn synthesize the pro-inflammatory markers, uh, which, are, which are IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor, and interferon gamma. And these will, will have a good effect, basically, as a physiology concern. But during severe viral infection, what happened? These will in turn affect your own cells, especially lung cells, heart cells, and whatever may be the cells. And it will destroy your own cells, thereby leads to end organ failure. In the case of COVID, actually lung injury will happen, and also kidney injury will happen, and also heart injury will sometimes happen because of pro-inflammatory markers. Uh, this uh, pro-inflammatory pro markers are controlled by means of anti-inflammatory treatment. Uh, so um, IL-6, I already said, is a culprit. It's a pleiotrophic cytokine, meaning that it has a both protective action in which Dr. Angappan, we can't hear you. I think you lost your connectivity. So, yeah, yeah. Come again, sir. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, some uh, viral strains increases the production of IL-6 to their own survival. Uh, so, uh, uh, automatically, COVID virus, when it enters, he won't, that, that's or not he. Uh, that virus wants to survive so that it will increase the production of IL-6. So IL-6 will concentrate on organ, not on viruses. So the viral, viral will invade like anything, and uh, it will live like anything, and it started destroying the organ. So uh, one theory is that upregulation of IL-6 is happening during excess viral load. So viral load is very high. Automatically, IL-6 is getting increased in a more amount. This IL-6, instead of uh, saving, uh, killing the virus, it will in turn destroy our organ. And overexpression of IL-6 might induce viral persistence also in other way. So automatically, what happened? Uh, prolonged period of viral infection, this IL-6 become a culprit. So in uh, modern medicine, they used to give uh, this uh, IL-6, anti-IL-6 antibodies. Uh, the, uh, tolucizumab is a uh, main uh, uh, component. Uh, actually, it's a drug which is given for uh, uh, this uh, IL-6 uh, blocking agent. Uh, next. Next. So anti-inflammatory homeopathic markers is also available. I came across on journal in the morning, in, uh, today morning, while going through this uh, interleukins. You know, this Arnica Montana is having a very good uh, pro-inflammatory a very good activity which decreases the IL-6. So by giving uh, this Arnica, we can reduce the amount of IL-6, thereby we can preserve the organ uh, which is in a critical stage, for example, lung, kidney, heart, or whatever it may be. So Bryonia is also having uh, this anti-inflammatory, that's pro-inflammatory action or anti-inflammatory action. And Thuja oxyndralis is also having uh, capability to reduce IL-6. IL-6 is a culprit, as I said earlier. So arsenicum album is already proven. It's the homeopathic perspective in COVID-19 coronavirus infection uh, fact sheet. Uh, they mentioned that uh, they will reduce cytokine. Apart from that, uh, G. officinalis, um, I read it in one journal in which it reduces the IL-6. So the anti-inflammatory homeopathic compound, uh, we can give it along with allopathic medication also so that uh, we can uh, give this homeopathic medication in an acute condition instead of giving it as a uh, what to say, uh, immunity booster. So uh, these Arnica, Bryonia, and Thuja are not immunity booster. 
uh, they will act uh, in an accurate way. Uh, it will in turn reduce interleukin-6. Once interleukin-6 production is getting, is getting decreased, we can save the organ simultaneously. Uh, we can also uh, kill the viruses also in the other way, what I said in another mechanism. And uh, the CRP level is also getting decreased by means of this arnica and other inflammatory markers, no, uh, that pro-inflammatory markers, what I said in the previous uh, slides, is also getting decreased by means of uh, this uh, very good uh, uh, homeopathic uh, drugs. So homeopathic drugs, not only immune boosters, as they can be given in an acute phase also. Uh, acute phase is then patient who are on ventilators or patient who are on uh, kidney failure because of this virus, patient who are on uh, uh, pneumonia and patient who are on uh, hepatic failure because of the virus can be given Anika Motana and uh, uh, Bryonia and Tuja Oxentralis. We can also include G. officinalis also. Uh, that I don't have literature. I have given you that uh, the thing, the anti-inflammatory homeopathic drug. Um, uh, drug dilutions, recent uh, LPS induced pro inflammatory cytokine, which was published by Chanakya, not uh, uh, at all. Uh, it's an uh, extramural research. Um, I actually picked the journal in a homeopathic uh, website only, CCRH. It's a CCR journal. If I have a time, you please go through and you are having more knowledge than me uh, with respect to Anika Montana, Bryonia, Artuja. I'm not able to pronounce it correct also. I'm sorry because. I am very much new to pronouncing these type of uh, drugs, uh, you know, and uh, next. So these are the, some automated clinical laboratory equipments. Uh, so biochemistry analyzer have some, uh, given some pictures, actually. So in short course of time, uh, our laboratory is going to be automated. Uh, now our laboratory is a bit uh, primitive. That is why we are not able to satisfy all the clinician, all the tests. But uh, I promise you in short course of, so short course of time, uh, uh, actually, Dr. Murlitharan is helping me a lot uh, for uh, uh, improving our, or automating our lab uh, to the core. So uh, we have a very good team already in our laboratory. We have a very good technician and we have a very good space and we need some certain uh, environmental uh, uh, changes also that I think, I hope it will happen, uh, happen in short course of time. Next. So these are the menu, no, as far as our NHRI batch laboratory, we are doing biochemistry, serology, hematology, and packages and clinical pathology test also. Okay, next. So this is a stat actually, this is a comparison actually I've done 2018 April and March 2019. Uh, the percentage of uh, investigation 2019 uh, April to March is somewhat high. It's very happy actually, it's a very positive sign in which biochemistry occupies the major part, next. Next. So it's a final slide for me, but it's the most important slide in which the Mahatma Gandhi is sitting down. Folded is like looking through a microscope uh, during the year of 1990 and seeing uh, leprosy jump in Sevagram in the year of 1940. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for uh, sharing your uh, vast knowledge about the uh, laboratory uh. assays. Uh, henceforth, uh, we will be Avoiding giving unnecessary tests. It was a very valuable session. Thank you uh, once okay, again, sir. Sir, one question uh, for you. The doctor uh, is asking about uh, that. Uh, is the antibody test uh, is for the COVID is reliable? Yeah, currently, actually, ma'am, I don't have much knowledge about uh, this uh, uh, COVID testing. Now, especially the COVID testing basically, you know, relates with uh, serology and microbiology. Okay, so okay. government is uh, actually you know, uh, uh, giving rights to do COVID test and uh, the report should be authorized by means of MD microbials. And you know, as far as my knowledge goes currently, RT-PCR test is a confirmatory test in which we are detecting uh, the antigen exactly, you know, instead of uh, detecting the antibody. Antibody is a response to the antigen, not an antigen. So something is there now. It can be sometime a rat also, <laughs> not okay. a thief. So detecting uh, the antibody is uh, basically uh, the presence of antigen uh, will give you the antibody. Uh, on the basis only we are detecting antibody. But uh, if you pick up the antigen means it's quite well. The okay. RT-PCR test uh, basically, you know, we are uh, detecting the antigen, mm. not the antibody. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request uh -huh. uh, Dr. S.G.S. Chakravarti, uh, Associate Professor from uh -huh. the Department of uh, Practice of Medicine, to deliver the uh, vote of thanks.
vote of thanks. Dr. Chakravarti, over to you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are audible, doctor. Go ahead. Yeah, fine. So uh, I first of all uh, thank Dr. Anjan. Uh, we feel like as if we are reading and also by biochemistry by what are the textbooks we have everything uh, was uh, stuffed up in this two hour duration what I felt uh, about the other participants I don't know but really highly knowledge uh, those enzymatic reactions and everything, all those biochemical reactions in this two hours is literally it is a, a bit uh, exhaustive process, what I feel. But anyhow, we try to cover starting from the biochemistry, starting from hemoglobin uh, count to up to vitamins and enzymes, all those he covered. Uh, I should thank Dr. Angapan, uh, but if everyone, anyone is having any special doubt, he can uh, mail to uh, the given uh, web link or the website. Thank you, uh, Dr. Angapan, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jayasri? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti. And yeah, our, yeah, uh, uh, next uh, session, next webinar will be on uh, reporting guidelines. That will be... Uh, yeah. It will be on reporting guidelines uh, by our uh, OIC, Dr. T.C. Murlitharan, sir, scientist for... Uh, he is also an HOD of the uh, Department of Practice of Medicine, NHRMH. So I request everyone uh, to attend uh, the session. Uh, hopefully, it will be in the next month of last week. So, uh, thank you one and all once again for your uh, participation. So, we will be concluding now. Thank you. We'll see you soon again. Thank you.